Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Uh, gave us a lot of food for thought. We'll be moving into the panel session, so if all the speakers could come back and turn your video on and uh, get ready to unmute yourself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of the questions and then pick out who I think should start with it just to keep it a little organized. But everyone feel free to chime in after that if you have anything to add. Also want to add for our attendees, please uh, keep the questions coming in the Q&A. Uh, and we will try to get to all the questions. So we're going to go ahead and start with a question for you, Walter. Um, they are looking for some more details, basically, about the fasting mimicking diet. What types of foods are eaten? Where can they get information about it and any variations? Um, and then it, are there any uh, restrictions to using it in terms of health conditions? Yeah, so the, the, of course, my book uh, is called The Longevity Diet. They can get that. I don't, uh, everything goes to charity, so I don't, I don't make a penny out of it. And, um, and also, there is a product called Prolon. Uh, um, I will also give all my uh, shares of the company away, uh, so I don't make a penny out of that either. And so, Prolon is the fasting making diet now, it's been uh, tested on, um, in, in three or four different uh, trials. Uh, um, and, um, and yeah, the composition is about 1,100 calories on day one um, and, and 800 calories on day two, three, four, five. And uh, it's plant, it's vegan. It's a vegan diet. Uh, it's uh, high fat, uh, and all the fats come from uh, good sources like olive oil and uh, nuts, uh, almonds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so that's um, that's a general composition, and uh, uh, we're about to publish uh, two more studies, uh, clinical studies, on the use of Prolon uh, FMD in both uh, healthy uh, individuals and uh, uh, people with hypertension and metabolic syndrome. Perfect, thank you. And, and a follow-up question on that is, what are your general dietary recommendations, um, both with and without FMD? And then I'd open that one up to the panel after that. Yeah, the general dietary recommendation, in the book I talk about five pillars, so you know, using epidemiological studies, the centenarians, clinical studies, basic research, and if you put it together, you come up with a, a pescatarian diet, so vegan plus fish a couple of times a week. And that seems to be a good way to, uh, very common for centenarians to eat, uh, you know, either white meat or red meat or, or fish at least uh, once a week. Um, seems to be a good way to uh, avoid malnourishment. Vegans don't do very well, believe it or not, uh, against uh, everybody else. So it may be uh, in part due to the malnourishment issue. Uh, most of them have low protein diet, at least for the majority of their uh, life. So the um, the uh, if you look, uh, uh, most studies suggest that a low protein diet, low but sufficient protein diet, is ideal. And this is particularly interesting considering uh, how much we hear about high protein intake and uh, and low carb diets. You know, um, a study from Lancet a few years ago showed a meta analysis showed that. It's better to have an 80% carbohydrate diet than have a low carbohydrate diet. So uh, people are confusing, I think, the excess uh, starches and uh, weight gain with uh, you know what's beneficial for lifespan, which is actually about a 60% carbohydrate diet. Um, and then uh, uh, 12 hours of fasting every day. I mean, we we hear about longer periods, 16 hours, uh, even 20 hours, but those are associated with benefits and problems. Uh, the 12 and 12, meaning say 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or 7 a.m. 7 p.m. feeding period, that seems to have almost no negative associations that I could ever find. So that's uh, the 12 on, 12 off uh, is a, uh, one of the recommendations. And then yeah, the FMD, the fasting or fasting mimicking diet, maybe three times a year on average. Thank you, uh, Kayla. I'm sure you have something to say about what you do in your practice. <laughs> Uh, how did you guess me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, I, can, I can build off of that, and, and I would say I, I agree with a lot of what was just said. Um, the the teachings in uh, the lifestyle medicine community that uh, have a strong evidence base behind them that that I have found to be effective with my patients, and I believe the evidence on it is mostly a whole food plant based diet. Um, so whether or not that includes a couple of servings of fish a week, um, it's actually a little bit of a gray area in my reading of the literature. It seems as though it depends in part on which outcomes we're looking for. 
So it does seem as though um, particularly fish that's going to be higher in omega-3 fatty acids, um, probably lower in environmental pollutants, uh, can give some benefit from the perspective of cardiovascular disease. Uh, it hasn't been clearly demonstrated, at least in my reading of the literature, that it reduces overall mortality. Um, but I think that this highlights a, a larger issue that we have often in you know, nutrition science and in looking at dietary habits in medicine, which is uh, we have a tendency to sort of lump types of foods together and ways of eating together that perhaps don't really go together. So, um, you know, we're speaking about, for example, high quality carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates and fibers, as opposed to kind of starchy, simple carbohydrates. We talk about carbohydrates generally, but they don't have the same health effects. Um, similarly, healthful unsaturated fats versus unhealthful saturated or trans fats, um, different types of proteins. Many of the studies on protein don't actually differentiate between animal-based versus plant-based protein. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there's, there are a lot of questions that are still out there. But when we look at the research that has been done in laboratory settings and in epidemiological settings, it seems as though it all supports a mostly whole food plant-based diet. Um, the research, particularly surrounding vegetarians and vegans, I find very interesting um, because there have been mixed uh, results there. And when we take a look at some of the studies that are powered more, it, that are more highly powered, and have actually taken the time to differentiate a what they call healthy versus unhealthy plant-based diet, that seems to be what really leads to the differences in the outcomes that we see. So um, one, one great study that was done uh, at Harvard by Dr. Fu um, maybe five or six years ago, um, they really broke this out. Um, excuse me, Dr. Frank Fu, uh, five or six years ago, they broke out healthy versus unhealthy plant-based diets. And what they ended up finding for cardiovascular disease, for example, was that people who were eating what they called a healthy plant-based diet, that's again, mostly whole foods, um, those individuals ended up having, you know, 25% decrease in um, their overall mortality in their cardiovascular disease. People who are eating an unhealthy plant-based diet, so think kind of, you know, Coke and Doritos vegetarian, um, those folks actually had a 30% decrease um, in, in their quality of health outcomes. Um, so there's a big difference between the two. Uh, so I, I would agree that generally when I'm counseling my patients, what I will try to do is sort of assess where they are, assess their interest in and readiness for change. We try to move them along the spectrum towards a more whole food plant-based diet as much as they're comfortable doing in a kind of stepwise fashion. And generally, unless someone is really ready and dedicated to go fully vegan, um, usually that's not something that I really try to push with them and unless perhaps they're in kind of, you know, advanced stages of chronic kidney disease and we're trying to avoid dialysis. Um, otherwise, I, I really don't because if someone is not really committed, it's much more likely that they're going to be on an unhealthy plant-based diet versus a healthy one. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, have to second all of that. So I, I agree with both of you very much. Um, it's not just what we eat, but the quality of what we eat. Um, so if we're listening to Volter and doing everything that he's saying, but it's all highly processed foods, then we're probably not going to get the benefits that he's showing us in our research. But if we're, and I know you actually talk about this in your book, Volter, if we're looking at more things that are grown and things that our ancestors would recognize as foods, like these veterinarians, that's a much higher quality diet. And that's really what we're looking for. So it's that whole food, mostly plants, not too much. Yeah. Um, so love that. Uh, we can move on to our next question, which um, I think I'll get you to start with, Kaylin, and then Nick to chime in at the end. Um, the question is, most integrative wellness plans and physicians are conducting their practice privately for civilians. Therefore, most of these programs are only available to a select few corporations or individuals. Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. So this is a this is a big issue, and I appreciate the question very much. Uh, so um, at GW, our life plan medicine program accepts all of the individuals who are patients at GW. Uh, so this is something that we have been really committed to very early on. We recognize that very often the I think you cut out, Kaylin. Was that just me? No, I can't, I can't hear her either. Okay. 
Kaylin, can you hear us? I'm going to try texting her. Kaylin, you actually broke out. Oh, I don't know if you can hear us now. Can you hear us now? Oh, sorry. Oh, we still can't hear you. How's that? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Sorry, we didn't hear any of that. Oh. Okay. Um, I will try to. Um, I will try to simplify. You cut out again. Can hear you again. Kaylin, is there a way for you to turn up the volume? I can hear you very faintly. Sorry, it cut out again, huh? There you go. I can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I'm going to keep a closer eye on it. Um, where did where did I lose you? Uh, pretty much at the beginning. Sorry. <laughs> um, so so I'll oh, give this one more go. Sorry about this, everyone. <laughs> so uh, at GW, all of our patients in the lifestyle medicine program, we, we take all comers. Uh, so we. We believe that the people who need this lifestyle medicine education and counseling the most are generally the people who, in a lot of the models that are out there, uh, will have the most barriers to accessing it. Uh, we are committed to making sure that all of our patients can access lifestyle medicine education and counseling. Um, I agree with you absolutely that this has historically been a problem in this field. It is changing, uh, and I feel confident that the, the access is continuing to expand uh, in part because um, this is a field that tends to draw people who are really committed to the idea of providing care to populations that is really evidence-based and, and grassroots. Um, I do see that there are many more practices just in the last couple of years now that have um, that are not cash-based, that are not concierge, um, that are, have really um, democratized their access. Um, and I think there are more and more physicians who are now becoming trained and board certified in lifestyle medicine. Uh, what I expect we're going to see, though, is that this is really the future of medicine. And my expectation is that in the next few years, um, and something that we're intentionally and deliberately working towards within, um, within our practice is to make sure that elements of lifestyle medicine that are really relevant to every specialty become incorporated in every specialty. Um, so we're starting with our medical students and residents, but uh, working on trying to get at those who are already in practice as well. So I believe this is going to be the future of medicine, and as um, as this evolves, I think those barriers to access are going to be are going to be minimized. Thank you. Uh, I will turn it over to Nick. But I did just want to mention one thing, just because you specifically said in the question, civilians. Um, that the VA has rolled out and is in the process of continuing to roll out the program they call the Whole Health Program. <clears throat> it's their Whole Health Initiative, and it is integrative medicine. It is just their terminology for it. Um, it's lifestyle medicine. It's it's looking at the whole person. It's incorporating mind-body practices. Um, so I think that the VA is trying to provide this for non-civilians as well. Um, so I hope that you will have access to that shortly if that's what you're concerned about. But in the meantime, if you do have private insurance, then GW is a great option. Um, Lee, do you mind if I jump in for just a minute? No, go ahead. Um, thank you for highlighting that. I missed that part of the question. Um, yeah, I, I would just say that the VA has actually been pretty far out in front on this. Uh, I know that they have particular uh, centers for excellence, uh, so this may not be available to every VA, but one of the other programs that the VA has really been out in front on is telemedicine. Uh, so I. I absolutely second um, what you've said there, and I think they have, they've been doing a nice job and they do have reasonable access that's growing. Thank you. 
Now, Nick, can you speak to maybe how some of the programs that you're doing maybe could be given to more people, given access to for more people, or things you're you're seeing in the the corporate world that are making them more available? Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Bravon that I think this is the future of medicine. The one thing I would note is at some point, I probably argue that it's further away than several years out um, for a number of different reasons. But I think the future of medicine or any field needs to be demonstrated in pockets and shown its success, and that's how it becomes prevalent. And so, unfortunately, the way um, the world operates and things like that is largely done in these concierge ways. Employers are beginning to adopt it, um, as I mentioned before my kind of presentation. Employer wellness programs have shifted a great deal in the last you know, 10, 20 years, and they're just beginning to touch on this holistic perspective. Uh, but more and more employers are doing it. I think personally, you're seeing the companies that perform the best or the ones um, the best in their industry category, that is, are the ones investing in their people the most, especially around in these areas. So um, how long that takes to demonstrate um, is unclear, but I think you're going to have proof points, whether it's with GW, with the VA, with a number of employers um, that are going to make this become the norm um, through just by virtue of success. And that just takes time um, to play out. And it's just the unfortunate reality in which we operate. There are situations where you know, we're tracking with the CMS in December, they released um, state-based grants for employers or employers, for state governments to include wellness programs as part of their Medicaid offering um, at the state. Um, they're all in the process of applying for those dollars. It's unclear who's applying and things like that. That'll all be publicly announced. I imagine the current situation has put that on a little bit of a back burner, just given different public health areas of focus right now. But I think that's what you need to have a major shift and really kind of democratization of this lifestyle wellness process is successes in certain areas. And the reality is to demonstrate success, you need a sponsor or funding and where that often exists in silos where it's good for testing to identify the specifics for how things work best will be in the employer um, arena. And so they're coming like ours and others investing in different approaches to holistic well-being. Uh, we obviously have a view of what this should look like and hopefully we're on the right side of that equation, but there are other groups, you know, pursuing that as well, just in different ways. And I think what's going to it's going to get better out in the market. The one thing I will note is I've seen, you know, again, like if you go ten years ago, people talked about social determinants of health a little bit in very kind of academic micro settings. I can't tell you the number of times I've been to an employer who thinks about uh, social determinants of health, and you know, the county by county rankings have done a good job about that. And I think it's far from where it should be, but they are, they do think about, um, we are going to recruit from the people that are in our community. And by virtue of recruiting with the people in our community, we are invested as an individual company and as a collective of companies in that area to think about green spaces, think about larger sidewalks, think about uh, food deserts, these type of things, whether uh, we think about them directly relating to our bottom line, they do, because at some point you can only be so influential on someone's health and so we do see more and more employers talking about that, thinking about it. Um, the one thing I will note is we wrote, uh, I blog a lot personally about just my thoughts and ideas. And one of the things I've been blogging about a lot is what's the world in a pre, uh, kind of current COVID environment and a post COVID world. And the one area which I do think it may hurt this progress that we're making is the fact that remote work, which is already a trend that was happening. I think COVID in many ways is accelerating things that are already happening. As it relates to the work environment, it means that we do not need office space. We can work remotely. As it relates to leisure time, it's Netflix is better than cable, things like that. It's just accelerating a lot of the trends that were happening anyway. And so my concern, because I do think there's some benefits to that, is that the social determinants of health issue, which is beginning to get traction with the corporate environment, begin to diminish because they say, well, why do I need to recruit within my community? I can recruit outside my community. And so who knows what that, um, how that shakes out, but it's something uh, we're certainly thinking about and keeping impulse on. Thank you very much, Nick. That was very interesting. Uh, and, and actually reminds me that, Walter, you have a nonprofit organization that you work on to try and spread integrative medicine um, as something that's more accessible. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so um, it's called Create Cures, uh, um, and uh, we're we're opening the clinic in uh, Santa Monica here. Uh, in the next, uh, well, we were supposed it was supposed to be open already, but uh, 
uh, awfully soon. And yeah, the idea there is not so much, I mean, of course, uh, um, it, it's going to go in the, in the integrative and lifestyle direction, but is to use uh, much more science within the clinic. So have a molecular biologist working with the physicians and working with the uh, dietitians uh, as a team uh, to uh, make uh, interventions much more rapid, particularly for uh, for advanced stage uh, patients. So they, they, whether it's the cancer patient or or the autoimmune dis disease patient, uh, how can we? And, and uh, you know, I hope. Uh, Eventually, we also bring in the technology. So it was very interesting what we heard uh, from uh, Dr. Dudley from uh, uh, Mount Sinai. So we'll, we'll like to introduce that too. So have an integration of technology, but also, you know, some of these uh, uh, old, idea, old ideas made new, like fasting, uh, and, um, and then have the molecular biologist uh, uh, and the scientist in the clinic and not just uh, as some idea uh that uh is consulted once in a while i think that the, the scientists need to be there um making the uh helping the the doctors making decisions uh particularly with complex cases thank you and while while we're chatting i have another question for you um and i know personally this would be a very difficult question for me to answer so feel free to say that the answer is it depends uh, but what is the recommendation for daily protein intake Kaylin, we'll talk, chat with you too. Yeah, daily protein is uh, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.75 to 0, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 uh, uh, grams per kilogram, so about 0 0.35, 37 uh, uh, grams per pound of body weight per, uh, per day, uh, up to age 65, 70, and then goes up uh, maybe 10% uh, uh, in those that are um, 70 and above. Uh, and uh, I think if you look at that, it's hard to find a study that will show negative uh, a negative effect. That as you go uh, much lower, of course you do, and and you definitely do as you go much higher. Uh, we're about to publish a meta analysis now on uh, IGF one, uh, which is the as I mentioned in my talk, um, is affected primarily by by proteins, and and so this is confirming very clearly the the need to keep the proteins in the uh, in the middle, in the low mid to law and uh, and the IGF1 in the in the correct range uh, also i hope uh, eventually IGF1 i mean the smarter use of IGF1 uh not just low and high because uh, we we're, we're, it's uh, the the analysis shows very clearly that both low and high are bad uh, uh so yeah so that the more sophisticated type of analysis is introduced in the in medical practice so that people can uh, that doctors can understand uh can interpret this in a in a in a more uh, appropriate way. Great, thank you very much. I, I just want to point that's such a common thing in nutrition that it's you want to be in the middle, not too little, not too much. So it's not overly surprising that that's how protein is washing out too. Kaylin, do you want to give your two cents? Um, so I, I will say that I agree. Um, I, I think in pounds rather than kilos. So uh, I would say 0.36 grams per pound. Um, it's, you're, it's going to give you the same answer. And uh, staying in the middle range, I think, is most important. Um, I think probably we're all aware that uh, there is a movement, especially among um, kind of certain sets of uh, fitness folks and trainers, to go kind of ultra high protein. Um, you know. I am hard pressed to say that there aren't reasons to do that if you're trying to be a bodybuilder. You know, I, I'm not sure that I can't speak to. Um, but from a health perspective, it is not a thing that I would recommend. And uh, so this is kind of an ongoing discussion that I have with some of my patients who are also working with trainers that are trying to push a lot of protein on them. <laughs> Uh, but I, I would agree uh, with Dr. Longo and with uh, Dr. Frame. Um, middle of the road is best. And let me just add one comment in my third book that I wrote for now just in Italy. Uh, it was shocking that Italian children were eating an average three to four times more protein than the pediatrician uh, recommend and every pediatric society in the world recommends. So it's really shocking. It was more shocking that the pediatricians were completely unaware of this. And I think I would be It'd be difficult to imagine how it would be that much different in the United States. 
Yeah, that, that sounds to me like it's probably the exporting of uh, American dietary habits. Absolutely. Nick, is that something that your company could help with? You know, how do we get the clinicians on the same page as the patients? And, you know, my background is nutrition. And so getting that data sometimes is considered difficult. Um, and I know that, you know, there are certain apps for that. Um, how would you go about making that easier for clinicians? Yeah, I think one of the hardest, and this kind of goes back to why physical activity still tends to be the focus of employee wellness programs. Employers, for better or worse, are very centric around um, show me what you're doing, right? In order, because these programs tend to have reductions in health premiums or, you know, some groups have fairly significant incentive dollars, which is why it's become part of like compliance issues with the EEOC and whatnot, because employers are just funneling more and more dollars tied to you know, the cost of health care and really offsetting it to the employee and tying into a wellness program. It's not the real intent and spirit of why wellness programs should exist. It's just the nature of how these employers, many of which not all, um, are gravitating and structuring their programs. The challenge, um, so I think the benefit and opportunity exists in the sense that there are a number of apps, um, all of which have made it as easy functionally that you can be in terms of making a logging nutrition. Um, that is like, you know, most people or many people eat similar meals regularly. So saving those meals to make it a one click log that I've, I've eaten this, uh, et cetera. And over time, it becomes easier and easier to, to log that meal. Now, the problem is eating healthy often, you know, encourage you to cook at home, do one cup of, you know, this, two cups of that, et cetera. And the healthier, the irony of these technologies is that the healthier you eat is actually the harder it is to log that in a nutrition app. Right. If I ate a McDonald's meal, it's a it literally it's a combo meal. One click, I can log it. Um, but you know these tech, these companies, by virtue of trying to out beat each other on the nutrition tracking side, are continuing to design um, new features and things like that. Uh, I don't know how promising this is, but a lot of companies are investing with um, imaging technologies with the ultimate goal of taking a photo of your meal, and they can somewhat construct with relatively relative accuracy the health contents of it. Yeah, that's beyond my uh, kind of bandwidth mentally to understand how that will work. And my guess is if it is a possible, real possibility, it's going to be one of those things that gets rolled out prematurely with limited efficacy, similar maybe to a lesser degree, but the heart rate tracking, which has gotten better and better from these wearable devices, but it's still far from a clinical tool that you can use. But um, that's just the nature of technology. We're moving toward hopefully a better and easier way of doing it to the extent that you could get individuals to log all their meals consistently. Um, the data is there for clinicians to use. It's just really hard um, to crack that nut in terms of getting anyone employee otherwise to adhere to the program. Great. Anything else on that you don't want to add or we can move on to different questions? We're going to be going to you again, Kaylin. Um, they wanted to know a little bit more about how you create enhanced peer support in a wellness program. And maybe Nick, you might have some thoughts on this too. Sure, um, that's, that's a terrific and I think very timely question. So uh, the, the concept, uh, let me just take a minute then I guess to speak about what we're talking about with the peer support program. So the, the idea here is that um, I, I had mentioned in my presentation the importance of these supportive and empathic connections in the workplace. Uh, we know and we have a large body of literature that demonstrates that those, those connections are not just pleasant, they actually make a really significant difference in terms of one's enjoyment of their workplace, um, one's sense of being valued in the workplace, and uh, one's risk of developing um, conditions like burnout. So we, we know that this is uh, very important to make sure that there are these positive connections in the workplace, not only to avoid negative outcomes, but really to help to boost positive ones. Um, so that's the idea that these peer-to-peer -peer supports are building off of. Um, the, the other concepts that go behind um, the idea of promoting peer-to-peer -peer support is that, um, first of all, a lot of folks, um, they may not have ready access in their everyday lives to the mental health professionals that might be available through their workplace wellness programs. So, for example, uh, we have um, employee assistance programs where individuals that are part of our institution can access a healthcare professional for free, around the clock, um, but that's something that they need to take an extra step to do. Um, there can also be some stigma associated with that, even though it's 
synonymous, um, people can feel reluctant to do that. Whereas your peers, by definition, are around you all day long. Um, maybe not so much actually literally all around us at this time. Um, but we're interacting all day with our peers. And so there are opportunities there for us to really leverage those relationships and take advantage of the proximity, the lack of, uh, relative lack at least, of stigma um, to, to, really, to really provide additional support. And so, so that's the concept behind these programs. Um, beyond that, as I mentioned, it really allows us to provide meaningful support where needed when perhaps we don't have enough mental health providers to, to meet the existing needs. So uh, the concept of these peer-to-peer -peer support programs uh, usually starts with um, another kind of hyphenated term called train the trainer. And so generally speaking, you'll have experts who come and start with a group of individuals who have um, been identified slash volunteered as someone who is interested in being a peer counselor or peer support. Um, those individuals receive direct training from experts uh, who have come in either from inside the institution or from outside the institution. And generally what they're being trained in is things like reflective and empathic listening. Um, how do you let someone know that they can speak to you comfortably without judgment, um, that let them feel as though they're being heard and supported? Um, that, that is, that's a skill set that some people have more naturally than others, but it can be taught. Um, other things that we do is make sure that those peer counselors, peer support are familiar with what are the resources that are available, that they feel comfortable, that they are prepared uh, to the level that they need to be, to be able to provide them, themselves their time um, in, in this way. Uh, I think very often what prevents people in the workplace or otherwise uh, from offering the support, um, offering their shoulder, so to speak, is that they, they can sometimes feel like, you know, I, I, I want to be there, but I don't know what to do if someone opens up to me. <laughs> so we want to make sure that people feel like they have the tools that they need emotionally, but also importantly, that they know what resources are available, um, that they feel confident that they can comfortably identify when maybe someone needs additional help and they can, they know where to refer them on to and how to do that. So, um, so this is the training that they receive, and then the idea is that um, from that initial cadre of peer support individuals who have been trained, then we continue to build an infrastructure around those individuals so we can kind of build the program, recruit more folks to act as peer support, and now we have um, more institutional experts who can continue to train additional individuals. Uh, so that's kind of in a, in a relatively brief nutshell, the concept. Thank you. Nick, did you have any thoughts about how we can engage peers to improve wellness programs? Yeah, it's funny when you asked ask the question, I actually didn't gravitate towards specifically peer support as it relates to, to mental health. I was thinking more of like when groups think of um, accountability groups and how to get people engaged in a program, which I think speaks to a broader point is that uh, everyone's different. And then everyone interprets things differently. Um, and as it relates to health and well-being programs, um, you know, we actually, our company acquired a company called Media Health in late March. And effectively, it was a product built around specifically peer interactions to get people to engage in what they call the daily challenge. So every day you received activity um, to do. And there are a lot of them are fun and interesting, like brushing with your non-dominant hand, right? And things like, you know, very odd kind of activities. They had a RCT trial that was published in a journal. They try, effectively tried to commercialize the solution and for a number of different reasons weren't able to do it. We thought it was pretty compelling uh, to see if we could take another run at commercializing that within our product. But more broadly, the way we think about enhancing a wellness program as it relates to engagement is that it needs to be multifaceted, right? There's individuals who would do it strictly for the money and the lower health insurance premium. Um, there'll be individuals who Am I still on? Oh, sorry, I got a question about my internet connectivity. Um, so uh, some will be driven by financial metrics, others will be driven by having uh, social and interactions with their peers and things like that, which is what daily challenges built around. There are other groups that want to do it based on goal set setting. We try building gaming mechanics into our product, right, where people, and that's the gaming mechanics are largely at least 
and the way we implement them today are very individually focused. Um, the example I give, which resonates more with people, is if you ever played Farmville, which is you know, an incredibly popular game, they always had people logging in and re-engaging because you plant your uh, little thing or whatnot, your, your harvest, and if you don't come back to harvest in time, it's gonna die. And you're gonna... So they had ways to constantly get people to re-engage with the platform. And so we are kind of scratching that surface in that way, daily challenge is a way for us to do peer support, again, more broadly, not specifically mental health only. Um, and that's our, I think that's gonna be the winning recipe. It's multifaceted, had something for everyone. The reason people engage in a program like this is very similar to like a pie. So there's 20% that are willing to do for this. There's 20% are willing to do it just because the right reason is because it makes you feel better being healthy. So it should be the right answer, but that's just a, just a piece of the reason why people um, care about their health. Absolutely, that sounds very promising. Nick, you'll have to keep us posted on that. I have one more question here, and unless anyone submits new questions, so go ahead and submit any more questions that you have. Uh, the last one is for you, Kaylin. What types of things are included in the wellness toolkit for managers and leaders? <laughs> um, I, I don't have a good short answer to that. <laughs> Um, I, I can give you an overview, and, and actually we have it posted online on our G Well Center um, webpage, so I can actually I can share the link as well in the chat box. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. Let me grab it. Yes. Um, we could also send that out. We're going to send an email later, so if you want to send that to Janet, we'll make sure it gets to everyone. Okay, terrific. Um, so broadly speaking, um, it's it's a we tried to keep it relatively short in the understanding that um, everyone's time span, especially uh, attention span, especially these days, is um, not terribly lengthy. Um, but generally, uh, what it includes is these are kind of practical, evidence based um, strategies and resources uh, for ways in which the manager or the leader can help their team to maintain resilience, reduce stress, or better manage the stress. Uh, and also um, to remember that they need to continue to support their own wellness. Uh, so I have mentioned in my presentation that we, we know that one of the biggest predictors of an individual's wellness experience in the workplace is who their manager is and what their leadership style is. Uh, so what we've done here is to say, you know, we, we believe that most people who are in these positions, um, they want to have a team that is well and is functioning well and is enjoying their work, um, but very often people aren't actually receiving formal training in how to do that. So uh, what we've done is kind of combed through the literature and shared what we knew are some good best practices that are evidence-based and put them into a format that is kind of easily digestible. Uh, so this is kind of building off of some of the things that we know are workplace wellness predictors, how can you optimize them, um, what are some specific kind of tips, strategies, resources. Um, and I, I'll leave it there, but we can, I'm, I'm glad to share it. All right, we have, to have about 30 seconds left, and someone just put in a question about, uh, as a soon-to-be intern, how can they get into lifestyle not medicine? Oh, okay. Um, well, if we have just less than 30 seconds left, the short answer is um, go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website, and you can also feel free to email me. And I did want to let you all know that you will be receiving communication after this and have access to PDFs of the slides that were presented today. I got several questions about that, so we will make sure that that happens. Uh, and we want to thank you so much for joining us. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, see you later, guys. Our speakers. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, see you. Bye.